Tonight's talk is on the Vatupama Sutta. Um, and I'm just trying to categorize this just to put a little bit of uh, context. The, the Sutta is primarily about the importance of what we hold in mind. And what we hold in mind, another modern word for that is mindfulness. What we hold in mind, what we're mindful of moment by moment is going to determine our experience in human life. And when you think about it just for a few minutes, that makes sense, doesn't it? That what I'm thinking about is going to determine how I feel and my experience of life. So this, the Buddha taught a very direct and methodical way of regaining control of our thinking. And in that way, we are actually regaining control of our entire life. Isn't that a wonderful thing? So that's what the sutta is about. Um, and if you have any questions as I'm going along, just please ask me. The Vatupama Sutta. <laughs> Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Buddha was at Savati in Jita's Grove, Anatha Pandika's monastery. He addressed those gathered. Friends, suppose an, uns an unskilled person dyed a dirty cloth. Whether the cloth, cloth was blue, blue <laughs> yellow, red, or pink, uh, it would take the dye poorly and the color would be impure. Why would the color be impure? Because the cloth was not clean. So the, the simile is pointing to the idea that if our mind is impure, no matter what we pour into that to change it, it's still going to have the residue of impurity in it. And this is a, this is a teaching on the importance of and the, and the possibility of letting go of all of those types of uh, impure thinking rooted in ignorance of the way things really are. The Buddha continued, so too, when the mind is defiled, stress and disappointment should be expected. In other words, if we're finding um, disappointing experiences in our life and we are reacting to that, we should understand that the reaction and the disappointment is, has nothing to do with what's occurring in the world. It has to do with how we're viewing it and how we're thinking about it. And if our thinking is rooted in <laughs> just to keep using that word impure, but I don't want this to imply that there's some religious connotation to that. If what we're holding in mind is rooted in that ignorance, we can only expect to create suffering for ourselves and more confusion. Now friends, suppose a skilled person dyed a clear and bright cloth, whether the cloth, cloth was blue, <laughs> blue, yellow, red, or pink, it would take the dye as intended and the color would be pure. Why would the color be pure? Because the cloth was clean. So too, when the mind is not defiled, freedom from greed, aversion, and delusion should be expected. A calm and peaceful mind will prevail. So what do we have to do? We just have to recognize and abandon the impurities that are within our own minds that we're holding on to. And the Buddha explains exactly how to do that in the rest of the Dhamma teaches how to do that. It, another word for this word of impurities would be, um, it would be these defilements and they can all be categorized with three words, greed, aversion, and deluded thinking. Friends, listen closely as I will teach you the defilements, and this is the long, the long version. The defilements of the mind, greed, ill will, anger, denigration, domineering, envy, jealousy, hypocrisy, fraud, Obstinance, conceit, prejudice, arrogance, vanity, and negligence. Not good qualities. Friends, the wise Dhamma practitioner knows these qualities as defilements of the mind. In other words, if we find ourselves acting in any of these ways, whether it's very subtle or, or um, very overt, uh, and actually causing harm in the world, the, the understanding is to simply recognize it and abandon it. If we fall into the trap of analyzing it or judging ourselves harshly for acting in this way or trying to justify it in some manner, as you know, none of you will remember Flip Wilson, but Flip Wilson was famous for saying, the devil made me do it. Most of us, does anybody remember Flip Wilson? Yes, you, yes. You, <laughs> and most of us look at life that way. We, we try to justify our own upset at the world by putting the putting the onus, putting the blame on what's arising or another person, when that can never lead to resolution, even if it's 
justified in a practical sense, the upset within ourselves is what we're after and to understand where that comes from. And that the upset within ourselves, the disappointing nature when that occurs in life is because of ignorance of the way things are. When we understand the world and ourselves as, as they truly are, as they are, are in reality, there's no reason to get upset in anything. There's no reason to take anything personal because nothing is personal. It's only because of a wrong view of ourself in relation to the world that we personalize what is completely impersonal. Friends, the wise Dhamma practitioner knows these qualities as defilements of the mind. Knowing this, the wise Dhamma practitioner abandons them. And in parentheses, my, my comment, and the speculative self-establishments that follow ignored greed and craving. When these defilements have been completely abandoned through developing the Eightfold Path, the wise Dhamma practitioner knows that these defilements have been abandoned. In other words, you have a direct experience of your own progress in developing the calm and peaceful mind. It's not based on any, any uh, conjecture or speculation. It's not based on any um, hope for merit because of how wonderful we do things. Um, I just as an aside, this week I'll be, I finally finished writing out, writing the Dhammapada. And this week is the last chapter, chapter 26, which is just remarkable in how this final chapter in this 26 chapter book shows so clearly what it means to practice the Dhamma. And there's a, it's a rather long section compared to the other, the other chapters, but it, it is just remarkable. And in, and there's one line, um, in there where the Buddha teaches that if we're chasing after merit, meaning I'm going to do certain things and act in a certain way because this, a God or some overarching spiritual system will then bestow on me this, this gift of something, a reward for how wonderful I am. Well, look at that. That's just more eye making. But the, the, the biggest problem is that it's completely speculative. No matter how much I might believe in it, I can't experience it, can I? Ever. I can believe I have experienced it. When I, when I pray that my team wins the football game and we happen to win, I can say, well, it's because of that prayer. But how do we know that? We don't. It's all speculation. And to, and to base my life or any life on speculative imagination has, has to be painful, doesn't it? At least that's what the Buddha discovered. Me too. When these defilements have been completely abandoned through developing the Eightfold Path, the wise Dhamma practitioner knows that these defilements have been abandoned. We know. We know they're no longer a part of us. The wise Dhamma practitioner, having abandoned the, these defilements directly, developing, develops unwavering confidence in me, meaning in the teacher of this Dhamma. They know the teacher as accomplished and fully enlightened. They know the teacher is endowed with clear vision and virtuous conduct. They know the teacher's knowledge is sublime and, com and a complete understanding <laughs> of reality and of fabricated realms. A teacher of all, they know the teacher is un incomparable among those who can be taught. It's an important line because not everybody can be taught. And just a bit of clarif clarification here. Uh, the Buddha never set himself up as anything other than a human being. And he never established himself as a savior in any way. And he didn't, he didn't, he did not intend. Why am I having so, so much trouble talking tonight? He didn't intend to, to teach a salvific religion. He simply wanted to teach people who they are in, relate, in reality, in re relation to the world they're living in. And so to end all their confusion, deluded thinking, and greed and aversion that rises, arises from that. And he holds himself out as one who has done this. He's not, uh, he's not asking people to take him as a savior or someone who can magically fix another human being. He can't. Nobody can but he can teach a completely effective way of doing that for yourself. And he spent 45 years doing that.
the Buddha continues, the wise Dharma practitioner, having abandoned these defilements directly, develops unwavering confidence in my Dhamma. They know my Dhamma is well taught, realizable, realizable here and now. Does anybody want to say if that's a real word, realizable? realizable? It is. <laughs> I would say no, but I use it anyway. Solid word. Realize, realizable here and now. They know my Dhamma is accessible, knowable, and brings immediate results, encouraging all to come and see for themselves. And what these, this section here is relating to is something called taking refuge or taking the triple refuge, meaning taking refuge in the Buddha as a human being who taught something incredibly useful, his teachings known as a Dhamma. And then this next section speaks of a well-focused and well-informed Sangha. And those three jewels, these triple refuge, is what every Dhamma practitioner engages with at some point. You understand the, um, a refuge is a place of safety and comfort. You understand the, the inherent safety and comfort in following a human being's teachings, his teachings themselves, and the importance of a well-focused sangha. It can't be overlooked. The Buddha continues, the wise Dhamma practitioner, having abandoned, abandoned these defilements directly, developing, wow, develops unwavering confidence in the Sangha. They know those of the well-focused teacher Sangha have entered the skillful, straight, proper, and true path. That is to say, the wise Dhamma practitioner knows the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. This well-focused Sangha is worthy of gifts, hospitality, and respect. This Sangha's gift to the world is incomparable. The wise Dhamma practitioner, having abandoned these defilements directly, knows, having, def having abandoned these defilements directly, even in part, meaning even as beginning uh, Dhamma practitioners, knows they have developed un unwavering confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. The... Um, you may not be able to say this yet, Olivia, and I for, sorry, I forgot your name. Michelle. Michelle, I'm sorry. Um, but I think the other ones would attest to this, that as you started developing the Dhamma, the results of the Dhamma allowed you to gain com more confidence in it, correct? Yeah. And that is, that is why this triple refuge is so important, because the, there, the challenges along the way, which are really fabricated but seem real, can only be overcome if we have confidence in what we're doing. Or it's just too easy to say, eh, this is too hard. I don't think it's going to work anyway. I'm going to try something else. And you, and you bounce to the next thing that you hope will fix you. When the truth, the truth of the matter is, there's nothing to be fixed, is there? Anything that's broken in this world is impermanent and fabricated. The Buddha continues, gladden, joy is born. Joyous in mind, their body grows tranquil. From a tranquil body, there is happiness. For the mind of one who is happy, concentration increases. Just as a stained and dirty cloth is cleaned with pure water, just as gold is purified with the heat of a furnace, a wise Dhamma practitioner, established in wisdom, virtue, and concentration. Those are the uh, wisdom, virtue, and concentration refers to the three-factored eightfold path. The beginning part of right view and right intention are the wisdom factors, right speech, right action, right livelihood are the virtuous factors, and right effort, right mindfulness, and right meditation are the concentration factors. A wise Dharma practitioner established in wisdom, virtue, and concentration eats the most delicious alms food, and they will not lose their way. That sounds like a very simple and singular um, description of what what develops but what the Buddha is really saying there is craving after and clinging to all sensual desires simply falls away even when someone gives us an incredible meal we just eat the meal you know and to clarify we enjoy it in its entirety and we understand how delicious it is but when we put down our fork we're on to the next thing we're living in our body moment by moment. 
our happiness isn't dependent on tomorrow finding exactly the same meal. Or identifying with it. Or identifying with it. I mean, that's, that's really that, what that means, isn't it, David? Identification with impermanent phenomena is just that. It, it's rooted in desire. It's rooted in always needing more. A self-referential ego personality is never satisfied. It always needs more to keep it going, to keep it distracted, keep it interested in its own life. A person who has developed the mindfulness that is developed through the Eightfold Path, path is simply at peace and content with whatever is occurring. Dukkha means, in, in one important translation, Dukkha means discontent. It means an ongoing discontent and uh, an insatiable discontent. The opposite of the, the opposite poly word of Dukkha is Sukha, which means a good, a, a good translation is content. But it's a profound type of contentment that allows us to flourish as human beings simply because we're in our life as our life occurs. That's true flourishing, isn't it? Actually living your life as it's unfolding, not wanting it to be different than it, than it is, not be stuck in the past or hoping that tomorrow is going to bring a better day. Right here, right now, we are content. Imagine the, the, the profound nature of resting in that contentment moment by moment, no matter what's occurring. Most of you, if not all of you, maybe not Michelle yet, but soon, have had that experience, haven't you? It hasn't maybe lasted for as long as you'd like. But I bet you, you would all say that you've had periods of profound contentment. Isn't that remarkable? I, I think it is. I, I mean, even today, I, I'm, not, I'm not jaded, you know, by the, when, I, when I notice a contentment, which happens a lot, it's still remarkable. It's, it's, what am I trying to say? It never gets old. You know, I did a, a lot of things, one after another, after another, trying to find something to keep me interested in my own life. And they all got old eventually. Does it remarkable because you understand it's impermanent? It, it's remarkable, yes. I mean, that, that's the foundation of it. It's impermanent, but it is continuing. And it's continuing because I continue to do the things like we all do that develop contentment in the first place. It's like that question I got, why does a Buddha meditate? continue to meditate after he became a Buddha. Why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't anyone that realizes the benefit of it? And it continues. Just as a stained and dirty cloth is cleaned with pure water, just as gold is purified with the heat of a furnace, a wise Dharma practitioner established in wisdom, virtue, and concentration eats the most delicious alms food and they will not lose your way. I, I, I know that I did do that twice. I did it for a reason. I'm not, I'm not getting that far. <laughs> Just to put it back into context. When I start doing it three or four times. And... <laughs> the wise Dharma pra practitioner abides with a mind permeated with loving kindness. You know that, wouldn't it be remarkable to have a mind that's permeated with loving kindness no matter what? No matter what we're hearing about the world, we just establish that. And it doesn't mean we become Pollyanna-ish uh, detached human beings. In fact, it means just the opposite. It means we are fully engaged, moment by moment, mindfully engaged, without the need for anything that's arising to be any different than it is. Why? Because we understand it simply can't be. If it's here, it's here. The wise Dharma practitioner abides with a mind permeated with loving kindness and compassion and sympathetic joy and with equanimity for the entire universe. Their mind boundless and free of hostility and ill will. The wise Dharma practitioner understands the three marks of existence and the path of liberation. That's just a, a excuse me, another reminder of the Buddha, from the Buddha, of what is the insight that we're hoping to gain. And it's, a, again, very specific insight into the three marks of existence and the interrelationship between a misunderstanding of self and this impermanent universe that we live in and the resulting discontent that arises from that misunderstanding. That's, that, again, is the entire focus of the Buddhist teaching. When the wise Dhamma practitioner understands in this way 
their mind is liberated from the fetter of sensual desire and of becoming. They are liberated, it, it be, becoming in this sense is, is becoming, continuing that ignorance that led you to this life of discontent in the first place and continuing the ignorance that can only lead to becoming further ignorant. Unless something's done to interrupt that, which is why the Buddha taught an Eightfold Path, that's all that we can hope for. They are liberated from the fetter of sensual desire and of becoming, they are liberated from ignorance. Liberated, there is the knowledge, I am, liber I am liberated. Giving birth to ignorance has ended. The pure life has been lived, the task is complete. You know it, you know when you're there. You know that I have overcome this world. This wise Dhamma practitioner is known as one who has bathed their inner being. Notice the simile. We've done the, the work necessary. We've developed the Eightfold Path to the point where we have, using that simile, we've cleaned our inner being of all impurities. As the Buddha says in many, many suttas, there's no ignorance left to provoke any discontent. Again, it's a remarkable statement and it's entirely achievable. Does everyone here believe that it's achievable? Back row? <laughs> it is. At this time, the Brahmin Sundarika was seated near the Buddha and asked, does Master Gautama bathe in the Bahuka River? The Bahuka River was a local river that has the, the uh, uh, the fabricated law of being able to clean up clean sins and re remove evil from you. Uh, there's many rivers around the world and and in India and Nepal today that still look at it that way. So does Master Gautama bathe in the Bahuka River? I was skipping over some of the light. The Buddha responds, "What is the Bahuka River? What can the Bahuka River do?" Meaning. He's, he's asking Sundarika, what is it except a river? It can't do anything else except be a river. Just like a human being can't do anything else but be a human being. Just like a mountain can't be anything but a mountain. It's just a river. How could it do anything to help change the way you think or clean you, cleanse you of evil or impurities? Master, it is true that many people believe that the Bahuka River can purify and bestow merit. Many people use the river to wash away their evil deeds. And so Sandarika is, is now arguing with the Buddha or using the argument that simply because of the number of people that are doing something is enough to give it validity and make it real. Of course, that's one of the most foolish ways of looking at anything, isn't it? It's that, what my mom used to say, if your friend jumps off the Brooklyn Bridge, are you going to do it? I did. Just kidding. The Buddha responds, whether the Bahuka or the Andakaka, the Gaya or the Sundarika River or the Payaga, <laughs> or even the Sarasati, the fool bathes in many rivers, but will never find purification for their unskillful deeds. And again, think, just think if that was possible. Think of the amount of power that we as human beings would, would gladly hand over to a river. And there'd be no reason to look at the, my cause of my discontent, because every time I do something that is causing discontent, I know that I can just jump in the river. Or I might go to a priest and get a half a dozen Hail Marys to clean me up. None of it works, though, does it? It's all based, I mean, maybe it does. I've never had the experience that it does. And so I stopped looking there and looked at something that could resolve the issue within myself rather than without myself, which is what those speculative practices do. You're looking for an answer without yourself. What power do these rivers possess? They can never purify the evil evildoer. Those who have purified themselves should be celebrated. They do much good in the world. Always wise, virtuous, and well concentrated. It is here, meaning the Eightfold Path, that you should bathe. If you wish to be a true refuge for all beings, 
It is here that you should be. That's why you hear me say that often. If, if I have, if I truly care for all human beings, which I think I do, the most effective thing I can do for all human beings, including myself, is to take to the Dhamma and awaken. Develop it to the point where I'm no longer a contributing factor to the discontent in the world. And that's really the most that any of us can do. And then from that point on, we may be able to have the profound influence that an awakened human being had during his lifetime. Siddhartha Gautama had a profound effect on lowering the amount of violence in northern India and southern Nepal. He didn't eliminate it because that wasn't his deal to eliminate it. But he had an incredibly profound effect on, on that one single thing by teaching people reality. And even those that only partially got it, they had such respect for the Buddha that they tend to listen to what he had to say. The Buddha continues, Brahma Sundarika if you teach false dhammas and harm other beings, and the implication is there, if you're teaching a false dhamma, you're harming other beings. If you take what is not offered you, and again, a, a Brahmin during the, the, uh, the Buddha's time was a, was a member of the highest social class caste in Northern India, and still today, that, that's true. And so they lived on taking what was not freely given. They lived on intimidating people to give them things. And, and there's, there's other aspects of that. And that, I don't know if I get too deep into that. That's why the Buddha is saying this. The Brahman Sandarika, if you teach false dhammas and harm other beings, take what is not offered you, following your belief, what could a river do for you? Listen to this great line. Any well contains water. The implication is if you think that water can purify, why don't you just go jump in the well? for all the good the river is doing. Hearing the great teacher's words, Brahman Sundarika declared, Magnificent, Master Gautama, you have made your Dhamma clear in so many ways. You have righted what was overturned. You have shown what was hidden by ignorance. You have shown the way to one who is lost. You are holding a lamp in the darkness for those with eyes to see. I take refuge in Master Gautama, in your Dhamma, and in your Sangha. Please bestow the going forth and develop your path. The Brahma Sandarika received the going forth, which means he was formally accepted into the Sangha. And he quickly realized for himself the culmination of the path. He understood that birth has ended, the well-integrated life has been lived. There is nothing more for this world. Sandarika was now an Arahant, an awakened human being. Thank you. Wonderful sutta, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> let me start with Jane tonight. Jane, how are you? I'm well. How are you, John? I'm good. What do you think of tonight's sutta? I <coughs> picked up on the word con tonight. Uh, I'm sorry. I was coughing. That's okay. I said I picked up on the word confidence tonight. Ah, and yeah. <coughs> <coughs> We're all <Boy>. coughing. <laughs> Even though my Dhamma practice is relatively new, um, I'm 100% confident that this is the way to, I mean, this is the way for, to get, you know, peace and contentment. This is, this is it. And that confidence has um, helped inform and support your Dhamma practice, hasn't it? Yes. I mean, like I'm, open. it's like, <laughs> it's, it's just totally, it makes sense. It works. It's <laughs> yeah, it is. It just works. All we have to do is do it. Thank you, Jen. I'm glad you joined us tonight. Lorna, good evening. Good evening. I'll sit in noble time. Glad you're here. Hello, Rob. Mm. Oh. Good evening, Helen. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um. Well, I was thinking about um, a story my son had to analyze when he was in college. And it was about um, a son who was living with his mother. His mother was outwardly racist. And he pretty much was too, but he liked to do anything that annoyed her. 
he was a, probably in his 20s and living at home too long and <laughs> didn't really have much ambition other than to annoy his mother. And so one day they were riding the bus and his mother quickly took a seat in the front and there was another woman who got on and the son took a seat next to her and then a black woman got on and the son made these magnanimous motions of giving his seat up to this black woman just to um, annoy his mother more than the kind gesture that she was in. And I remember having a conversation with my son about this, how outwardly that may have been seen like a genuinely kind and thoughtful thing to do, but the intention was wrong. Yeah. And um, that 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 um, that distinction, you know, that just that <clears throat> subtle layer of intention there made all the difference. You know, mm -hmm. was, um, and then there's this other incredible movie called um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I saw that. Where people um, in their lives, if they've been in a relationship and it didn't work out and they want to forget all about it, they go to this doctor who then removes the memory from them. Well, the problem was that people would then go back and repeat the same mistake. <laughs> so they were in this eternal loop of creating the same mistake yeah. because they never just, they the yeah, experience. like they, pardon? They didn't have the direct experience. Yeah, they thought uh, going in the river would purify yeah. um, their minds. So it was sort of the same kind of thing. Yeah. It was based on a line in a poem by Alexander Pope. Um, but anyway, that so, you know, that people do that. They pretend they didn't do something or they pretend yeah. they didn't say something. And, and, oh, yeah. and trust that everyone else will go along with the farce yeah. to the point where they believe their own um, uh, yes. fabricated lines. Yeah. So anyway, this, um, to me, this suit is very relevant. Yeah. Great insight in seeing it that way, because that's, that's just what it's about. And, uh, that that first uh, story you told is such a perfect example of greed, aversion, and deluded thinking because all three of those were in play when he offered the seat. Mm -hmm. He was greedy for self-acknowledgement or to be acknowledged as this wonderful guy. He was practicing aversion towards his mother by doing it, and he did it all out of a deluded mind. Mm -hmm. and, and look, I mean, it, it's you could say it's a somewhat innocuous aspect of stress and suffering, but it's just that type of results of ignorance that infects the entire world. Those, those seemingly little things that we, we might tend to overlook. We only notice the real, the big you know, examples of it, but this much more subtle level. And it allows this, this gentleman to continue his greed, aversion, and deluded thinking because of the response from other people whose minds are rooted in that same ignorance. And you have this just constant low level of frustration that goes through the whole world. Yeah, and that's right. And, and as long as people don't end up killing each other, we tend to not we tend to just ignore it. We ignore the ignorance. It's only when things get out of hand that we tend to want to take notice, See, whether it's within ourselves or in society. Mm -hmm. As large, I don't want to get into another political speech because I get myself in trouble. Right, this. but I remember being in my own family when I was young and seeing that low level of aggression going mm. on almost constantly always. and it would drive me crazy and, it, and they keep asking me what what's your problem what why are you upset yes. you don't see what's going mm. on here mm -hmm. always the same way I, that, that type of thing always drove me crazy and no and when i was a kid nobody saw it it was in within my family or you know, maybe in school or church or something like that why don't don't people see this subtle aggression that we're that we're all a part of? But you know, most people are, I, I guess, from my point of view, they were just too busy to notice, <laughs> and maybe I was a little too sensitive. But, 
it, it's really the it's the common expression. You know? It's not the results of ignorance that end up in, in wars are awful and some of the more egregious things, but it's this low level, almost hidden type of ignorance that allows us to continue living this way. And it's, it, it's truly unfortunate. But the Buddha realized that. I mean, it, this is the, the remarkable thing to me about what Siddhartha Gautama realizes just this. He was able to recognize the results of ignorance rather than ignore it, like every other human being up to his time did, at least as far as I know. Sure. Thank you, Helen. It's great. Mary, good to see you this evening. Mm -hmm. Good to be here. Um, it's the subtleties that I love. Yeah. Um, where I really feel like my learning um, happens when I understand the subtleties. And I think really um, every day um, I have the opportunity to um, work with many, many people. And there's all different, um, you know, this, all different frequencies going on all the time and I guess really the point is how do I respond to them how do mm -hmm. I help others how do I not I might help by not reacting right there's all mm -hmm. different uh, and that's been the most meaningful thing and that's what this sutra speaks to me about is the basic that basic concept is um you know am I mean in those situations am I maintaining my right view I write an intention, you know, the entire eightfold path, or at least most of it, <laughs> um, to keep the right thing in mind, to have the right reaction or no reaction at all, yeah. um, in order to keep myself content, um, but ideally to contribute um, contentment to each situation uh, that I deal with. So it's very relevant in all different facets. Um, it also speaks to the direct experience that we have that reaffirms that this works, this makes sense, practical, logical, it's not mystical, and you can use it right away. You don't have to you don't have to build up to it. You don't have to become an advanced meditator. You can get an aha moment here and in a matter of days have something reflecting back on you that um, affirms the practicality of the Eightfold Path, the impermanence, um, the dukkha that just is, um, but doesn't have to be made any worse by your own contribution. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you for what you just said. So it's, it's fair to say that your thinking has changed a bit. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that remarkable? I mean, I, again, I, because the reason why it's remarkable is people don't change the way they think unless something comes along. It's, it's not. You have to be willing to have your very, what you might call your foundation, but it might just be all your fabrications. Yeah. Well, then you have to be ready to have those rocked or chipped or, you know, whatever. And then you go, oh. Well, that's it. You have to do it yourself. To, yes, and you do do it yourself, which is, yeah. I think, probably one of the things that was so fascinating to me because I was like, well, that I can do. Yeah. Right? If it's up to me, then I can do that. I can unwind this or I can unlearn or relearn. Yeah. And, um, and then, it, and then the, the doing yourself is to also hold yourself accountable and at the end yeah. of the day when you're suffering or you acknowledge that you caused others to suffer even in subtle ways that you know you can get up again the next day and start over you know almost with a clean slate and uh, do better because of the knowledge being right yeah, yeah. yeah. wonderful it is thank you thank you Sean. baby good to see you this evening Glad you're here. Melissa, you um, don't feel like you have to say anything, but if you, uh, <laughs> you're going to hear, it'd be much easier if you just answered to Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, <laughs> don't feel like you have to say anything, but I would love to hear what you have to say. Oh, sure. Um, I just want to say that I'm so grateful for the 
<laughs> What's your name? <laughs> uh, just anything, if you have any questions about tonight's sutta or what we're doing here, anything um, related to this. I thought it was really nice. Um, this is my first class, obviously, but I'm really dying. Someone, I'm not proud of it, but I definitely, I have, I don't really have a problem not making other people suffer like like um physically or anything like that but definitely like i um i don't know maybe i lack like that like empathy for it and stuff so i definitely it's just something like hearing everything like it is something that um i do think about and stuff like why am i like this and all that kind of stuff so yeah it was nice i like talking to them well i hope you hope you come back <laughs> Um, and again, if you want to hang out for a couple of minutes, I'll give you a little bit more direction after class. Olivia, good to see you again. Hi. And that little one's doing well. I remember she was, she yeah. was just, I think, around one when you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she's so great. Ah, great. Oh. Yeah. Everything kind of externally, uh, even though I try to work on that, you know. But this, I think, brings me back to like myself, you know. Yeah, that's the and point. Not, you know, to your daughter in here, like holding on to everything, you not know, wanting to do certain things, or else I'm going to talk to well, Olivia, that, that's great insight to just understand that that constant grasping after the next thing uh, doesn't work. It's just, and it is just a, a, it's a common distraction. Everybody has done that here, at least in the past. Because well, all those things that you feel like they're holding you up are going to, you know, take you down. Yeah. 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 I'm glad you came, you came tonight. Russ, good to see you. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Good. Um, not much to say other than I thought it was very clear teaching. Good. Um, thank you for that. Pretty obvious that, you know, where the Eightfold Path comes into play. And, it, and I also like that at the end that he talks about the joy of it. You know, it, is, it isn't just work. There's a lot to be gained joyful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you're a teacher. Yeah. You know, so I like, you know, we said, well, you know, I've got to meditate, i got to think about this eightfold path, <laughs> all this work, you know. But at the end of the day, yeah, there's joy there. So yeah. I, I'm glad you came to that. Thank you. And you've done the work and you've experienced this. Your, your confidence in what we're doing here has grown. Yeah. yeah. Remarkable. Glad you're here. Liz, good to see you. Good to see you. Good to be here. I think the biggest benefit for me has always been the idea that um, meditating um, is the time to step away from your conditioned responses to things to kind of uh, work towards clearing your mind. You're not um, absolutely working on something while you're meditating but but what it does over time is that and you see it for yourself in your life that you take a uh, step back you take things less personally um, those grooves that you've dug um, in your life to defend yourself or um, the way you operate through life um, they soften and um, uh, you're not as apt to respond in a negative way. And it's just this whole other way of living kind of opens up. And um, that's the thing that I appreciate the most. Me too, I think. Thank you, Liz. Um, a few things. I mentioned the 26th chapter of the Dhammapada and sitting here, I think we're going to, uh, that'll be my, that's my uh, podcast for this week, but I think I'll teach it again next Tuesday. 
because it really is a remarkable uh, chapter. And I've been threatening to, to uh, spend the summer on the three marks of existence. And uh, I'm still threatening it, but <laughs> it's going to be a little bit. We're not going to take it personally. Yeah, good. Uh, we, there's a lot of good stuff that we're going to touch on before that. Um, as I started writing the outline, I realized that um, I really want to kind of reshape how I present the three marks of existence. Uh, and I also want to have as much as I can to have the whole, and I think it's going to be a, a, maybe even a 12 week program, but at least the, the entire outline ready to go and that we can all refer to it as we go along. Um, yeah. And again, as I started writing it out, I realized that uh, I think the most important beginning aspect is to relate the Buddha's life and his search directly to what he taught as useful insight and, and how he developed that. Um, so that's going to be a part of it. I think it's going to, um, I think it's going to be another part of another book, um, but I think it's going to be a remarkable couple months of study. I hope, I hope it ends up that way. <laughs> we'll see, but it is the, it's the key theme. And I, we've, we've never spent, like we've done on jhana and, and fabrications, et cetera, different themes. We've never really spent a considered focus on the three marks of existence, and it is the, the central theme. And I, re I thought about this on our past retreat, to really get into what, it, what dukkha means, what discontent means at the point of contact. And, and we'll talk more about that, what, it, what that actual experience of it is, because that's, again, that's what it's all about. It's not running away from dukkha, it's really understanding it. So by the end of uh, the summer or early fall, we should all know it, we'll all be awakened. And uh, we, can, we can go to Italy and spend some time. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Ron. Okay, uh, I think that's it. We'll finish as we always do with, with Meta. So find your relaxed meditation posture. We'll just take a few moments to become mindful of your in-breath and your out-breath. And these are the Buddha's words on metta from the Karaniya Metta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, Peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born. May all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you all for wonderful class tonight. Thank you, Jane. Peace. John, have a good week. You too. Thank you.